And good afternoon from yet again another snowbound Pittsburgh. A couple of days ago we had uh, rain, rain Mageddon and uh, it never stopped raining for ages and ages and ages. And now and we had ice and now we have snow again. This winter is certainly making its impact on the city and just about everybody else uh, around it. Hello, David. We are surviving the severe weather. Actually, we're very lucky. I moan a lot. Hello, James. We we moan a lot about it. Hi, Grace. Um, and Margaret. Cold and snowy Brookline, just like here in cold and snowy Regent Square. And James, I'm sure it's if spring is on oh, spring is on the way. Yes, ever the optimist. Um what was I saying? Uh, I shouldn't complain because far, uh, other parts of America have had far worse weather than us. And it is a strange thing, but Pittsburgh does seem to, the weather, the weather does seem to skirt us. I think it's something to do with the mountain ranges or something like that. But it hasn't been as bad as it has in other places. I know that Boston, for instance, was like two feet of snow. It reminded me, I visited Boston in 1971, I think it was, arrived on the 2nd of January, and there's about six feet of snow in the city. So um, I, we shouldn't complain about sort of six to ten inches. But I do complain, because I like complaining. It is my right, and I will continue to do so. It's also got quite cold again, and is going to get a lot colder. And that's the annoying thing. You get all that pretty snow, it looks lovely, and then it freezes solid and you slip on it instead of crunching through it you slip upon it um anyway let's not complain we have our health for the moment and and on the upside no further bridges have collapsed in pittsburgh since last we spoke so you know there's, there's an upside to everything although everybody is now becoming very conscious of the number of bridges that just might. And there's another one that I drive over regularly, which has just been described as in horrendous condition. So I think I'll stay home, talk to all of you. Uh, anyway, uh, it's now two. So as usual, we'll give the extra couple of minutes for people who are probably not parking their cars, but possibly checking their boilers and put, turning up their central heating and shoveling the footpath in front of their house. You can always subscribe to the YouTube channel. If you haven't already, please subscribe. And also, don't forget to tell your friends to subscribe as well, because the more subscribers we have, the better advantage we get on our YouTube channel. Uh, everything is up there on it. Um, you can find out all sorts of things there. What if you follow my example? God help you. Um, I would never advise anybody to follow my example of doing anything, ever. I don't give advice. I usually find if I take my own advice, it fails miserably. So why would I do that to others? Unless I don't like, if I ever give you advice, it's probably because I don't like you. Um, thank you, Jim. We're glad you're here. Um, and uh, and as we are to every one of you who joins us, hello, Barry, uh, who is greeting everybody. So as I say, please, please go to the YouTube channel and become a subscriber. Um, it does make a huge difference in terms of, of what the advantages we get out of the, the channel. All our past webinars are on it. You get all our information there, and you can also go to the website. Um, and thank you, as it says there, to everybody who has supported uh, our, uh, our uh, 2022 campaigns. Thank you for being here. Thank you for staying with us. We are very proud of the fact now that the webinars, uh, one aspect of our work, the webinars are now literally worldwide. Uh, and that means a lot to us. And um, it's it's nice to know there that in the far reaches of the Antipodes, there are people who tune in and check us out. It makes a big difference. Always please think about making a donation. You can do it on the website. There it is, pictheater.org, and with two Ts. And uh, those donations, no matter how small, really, really do make a, a huge difference to us. And a point I keep making, we do get grants from foundations and, 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 and from corporations, and that helps us to keep the company running and to pay the rents and the utility bills and salaries and what have you. 
but it is your donations that put the plays on the stage. And so every time you make a donation, no matter how small, you are part of each and every production. It's your donations that help us keep the theatre alive and thriving. It's your donations that build the scenery, pay the actors, and, and as I say, entertain the audience. You are a direct member of the production family when you send us a donation. I want to say thanks to, yet again, uh, thanking the Allegheny Foundation, who sponsored us completely for last year, for uh, the, all the webinars for 2021. And hopefully we'll do the same again this year. I want to thank the Chosky, Buell, Pittsburgh Foundation, Buncher Foundation for all their support for all our Picked Educates programs. And that is one aspect of what we're doing that we're beginning to expand. We're doing more and more in terms of educational expansion. And once the once uh, once uh, high schools get back to a sensible regime, we hope to be revisiting them, coming back to them, and bringing them more about live theater. Hello, Gary from Verona, out on the Allegheny River. Has it frozen? No, I think it probably is flowing. Hello, David. Welcome. And Debbie. Yes, very snowy Pittsburgh. Anyway, having done those thanks and made those points, and I've got a few more bits of news at the end of, of, of today's um, uh, webinar, we return to today's webinar, which, as you know, is part of a a four-part um, sequence I'm doing on the nature of and the importance of Greek theatre. Hello, Joanne. Um, uh, the importance of Greek theatre in, in the evolution of this art form that, of which we are proud practitioners. Um, so part two today, I have called Sit Down and I'll Tell You a Story. Now, why that? Well, let's begin with this notion. The word theater has two fundamental meanings. It is a place and it is an action. The action of theater is the presentation of the play, the writing of the play, the rehearsing of the play, the acting of the play, the watching of the play, all active things. Uh, you could almost make it a verb, to theater. Um, but theater is also a place. It is a place wherein that action occurs. And so we have to ask ourselves, well, why does it need a place? We, and what is that place? How is that place formed? What, what, is the, what is the derivation of that place? Why does that place come into being? Um, if you, it's a strange thing. You, you, if you think of any art form, any practical art form, any art form that involves action, you could play a musical instrument anywhere from a great concert hall to a street corner. You are still creating music. You can paint in a studio and hang the painting up in your window for people to look at, but the tendency is to put it into a gallery or into a place of exhibition, a place where it can be seen. Um, for the writer, you, you write words, but you publish them in a book so others can read it, and those books will go on to bookshelves or libraries or whatever. There always seems to be not merely the action of the art, but the place of the art as well. And theatre, which is described both in terms of its action and of its place, is no different to any other, and may, to my mind, be one of the origins of that particular concept. Theatre is much broader than merely the art of acting. Theatre is about the exhibition of art. Um, we use that word in so many contexts where action takes place. For instance, we will describe a battlefield as a theatre of war. We will describe the place where you have your gallbladder removed as a theatre for operations. It is and usually the term theater because those operations used to be watched by an audience and still are to an extent. That's how doctors learn how to be surgeons. They watch it happening. Yuck. Um, so why and how? Uh, and I want to look at what a Greek theater was because my contention is of course, naturally, that it is the foundation of where we watch the action of theatre right to this very day. What was it, what it looked like? How did it develop? 
and how it probably worked. And as I always repeat, everything I tell you may be wrong. It is simply my observation, my thought, my consideration. So, a theatre, fundamentally, is a place of storytelling. But it is also, and there are those of us who still believe this, a sacred place, a temple. And it is derived, as we talked about last week, from a place of worship, from a place of philosophy, from a place of poetry, where the word, the use of the word, became not simply an act of communication, but a fundamental of communication. And again, as we talked last week, as with all um, other forms of human expression, art is an attempt to understand the human condition and to explain the human condition. And the most primitive of humans made art in order to do that. Those early acts of communication were the primitive attempts, in fact, not attempts, but the primitive successes at art. And their primary form of art was storytelling. And as I said last week, either by dance, by painting, but primarily by the spoken word, by primarily a description of what they had done, a description of how they felt, a description of their success, a celebration. They might even have sung songs to it because a song is simply the spoken word set to music. It's the same thing. And for primitive societies, the, which would be the, the family units of early humanity, uh, since that's how it seemed to evolve in, in family units that grew and grew and grew. Um, and whether that was the Homo sapien development or the Neanderthal line, which we all have some, some genetic relationship to, uh, that notion of the family unit that grew and built as, as the hunter-gatherers began to come form into tribes, and eventually as the tribes began to settle and move from hunter-gatherer to, 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 to a farming concept. That story of passing down knowledge, passing down information, passing down mythology, passing down religion, was a verbal tradition. It was done by the storyteller. And for that unit, however small or big it may be, storytelling could really only happen in a place of safety because it was a dangerous work, world out there. The, you know, <laughs> to quote Game of Thrones, the night is dark and full of terrors. Um, so they were gathering caves, they were gathering safe places, they were gathering places they could protect. And in the dark, they needed one very special thing. They needed to feel safe, to feel secure. They needed one particular thing which they had seen, discovered, um, and, and learned to tame to a major degree. So they would gather round this place and tell the tales, tell the stories in the security and safety of this. And this gathering round is the important point. And what is that thing? Well, if we look at our first picture, it's the campfire, and we're still doing it. Thousands and thousands of years have passed, but the principle of gathering in a circle around a fire has made a part of our basic tradition of storytelling. All societies have this tradition. Every single society has that tradition of the gathering around the fire, and that as a story would be told, it would be told by a speaker who might stand in that circle, watched by that circle, to place him or herself close to that fire, the light of that fire illuminating their face, the light of that fire helping to demonstrate the nature of the story being told, or the nature of the prayer being prayed. And every society, I, I keep emphasizing this, this notion of, uh, of a religious base and a historical and a mythological base are all married together to formulate, to begin to develop this concept that who we are and what we know and what we believe is passed down generation to generation to generation through the act of storytelling. And so the storyteller would begin with that simple phrase, sit down 
and I'll tell you a story. You still do it today. So, as I say, all societies have this tradition. For example, there is the Irish tradition, and I will quote that one because it's the one I understand best. The Irish tradition of, and it's not just Irish, it's, it's throughout the whole of Europe, it's throughout the, the, any, 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 anywhere in the world where society began to civilize and, and to grow together. I'm going to show you this particular picture, uh, a second picture I want to show you. And most of you know anything about Irish history will know the Irish hearth was the place of gathering. And that was really exactly that, a place of gathering. It was the center of the home. The fire was the place where you gained warmth, where your food was cooked, where you felt safe and secure. Notice in that picture, a bed is beside the fire. It is the place of safety. Just as for the very primitive man, the, 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 the campfire was that place of safety. Uh, in traditional times, in all in, in times gone by, the villagers would gather together in a particular house and they would sit around the fire. They might dance. Uh, one of the reasons they say that Irish dancing, they don't wave their arms about, but it's because there wasn't enough room in the cottage for waving arms. So you just used your feet. But they would gather around and the tales would be told. And the communities would have, and we use this word, um, specifically, but I think it is a very general word, the bardic tradition, the one who told the tales. The bard was the one who told the tales. And as they as they developed their skill and developed their awareness and developed their knowledge of mythology and religion and history, those tales would become formulated. In Ireland, we would call it the Shadahi, the man who was the teller of tales the poet who dealt in a verbal tradition of recounting the past, the myths, the traditions, the faiths. This is an Irish tradition under the term Shanahi, but this bardic tradition happened all over the growing civilized world. The Nordic traditions, um, the, uh, the traditions in, 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 around the Mediterranean of telling the past as a story, as a story that could be learnt. And, you know, we always do that. We, we teach our children by, first of all, telling them very simple versions of facts. And slowly, as they grow, they evolve, the, those, those, those stories evolve into more complex and complex things until eventually they're in university taking degrees in, 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 in things that will give them no advantage as a career. But it is the telling of these tales in this bardic tradition that is the next major step forward towards the creation of theatre. But also in the creation of a theatre, of the physical place. And where we began with the fire, and we moved to the hearth, the heart of the home is the hearth, where a place where you gather around the warmth, around the safety, around the security of the fire, and the tale is told. Every developing society had its equivalent. Now, the ancient Greeks, it must be said, had a particular advantage over the rest of us, better weather, certainly a lot warmer weather than societies further north. You know, and if you look at the Nordic tradition, uh, the Russian tradition, uh, even the, the, the British tradition, the Irish tradition, um, the even as those traditions would have uh, developed amongst Native Americans, the further north you went, the colder it got. And so you would gather in, in different ways. The Greeks had the advantage of fairly decent weather. And so as their social gatherings grew, as their religious activity grew, and the, and the gathering would grow larger, as I say, the family unit became the tribal unit, and eventually uh, a, a larger society would evolve um, the circle uh, around the, the bard or the storyteller would grow bigger and bigger. And eventually it would become not so much a circle as a semicircle because it was easier for the bardic uh, person, the, the, the teller of the story, to see everybody if he didn't have to keep looking behind him. So that notion of gathering around to look at 
the teller of the tale began to evolve. The other thing, um, uh, much favored by the Greeks, who, as I talked about last week, for whom verbal communication was vital, the spoken word was everything. They didn't have to worry about a fire. What they had to worry about was being seen and heard. And they began to make um, uh, a, a use of nature. They began to find places in which they could be seen and heard easily by a larger number of people. And so began the use of what we now describe as the natural amphitheater. And our next picture shows what I mean by that. If you have a, now that's been that's been terraced to a degree, but get, you get the clear picture that somebody standing in that uh, that bottom corner, the bottom right hand corner, could easily be seen and heard by anybody sitting on those uh, those terraces. Sometimes the terraces are natural. This one was natural, but has been has been manipulated. But you get the clear picture of how the bardic person, the person the teller of the tale can say, sit down and I'll tell you a story and everybody can see him or her, although by and large, mostly him. The world had not evolved far enough yet. So that idea of, is still an extension. It's simply an extension of that notion of gathering around the fire, gathering around the hearth. But in terms of, of Southern Europe, this particular image of uh, the gathering uh, is centered much more on um, the outdoors, the open air, daylight, and being seen and heard. But they're still doing the same thing. In that natural amphitheater, the speaker can be seen by all. The natural acoustic, the natural ambience of the place would assist in the way the speaker um, could, could address the gathering. But the function is still the same. But however, I think the Greeks were onto something rather clever, because they began to realize, because they had an awareness of, of mathematics, they were very intelligent people, um, that this, this, is, this is a natural place of presentation, of exhibition. And that the bard, who we will now begin to describe as the poet, could, could, could gather together and address efficiently a greater and greater number of people. But also in terms of the religious aspect of, of it, that any ceremonial needed to be shared, needed to be seen and shared by as many people as possible. So that you have this, this slight shift, not simply in the telling of tales, not simply in the recitation of poems, not simply in the recalling of mythology or, or the rendering of history, but also in the act of worship, that the poet and the priest occupy the same place in this evolution, to be seen to worship, to be seen to honor, to be seen to recite, to be seen and heard, especially heard. So, as these places grew in sophistication, both as places of worship and places of, of the spoken arts, as we talked again about last week, the, grew the, 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 the principle of competition and festival, the celebration of uh, religion with particularly Dionysus, uh, where the, the first formal presentation of poetry would take place, um the um the architecture of such a place started to grow once humanity gets an idea there's no going back ideas can't be unthought an idea will always develop will always breed a new idea will always breed a development and once that that discovery that realization of that gathering place had got into the minds of, uh, of humanity, they would develop it. It was inevitable. And the Greeks were very good at mathematics and very good at building, very good at structure. So 
they began to develop the natural amphitheater into something that was more efficient, because that's what invention is. We get an idea and we try to make it more efficient. And anybody who's ever seen a photograph of the original vacuum cleaners will know just how remarkable that thing that goes around your rooms all by itself really is. It's the same, doing the same job, but so much more efficiently. And that's the way the mind works. That's the way humanity works. We try to, we strive for better efficiency. Um, so the design of these places ceased relying purely on what nature offered and took nature and enhanced it. And the design of these particular places, and here we are, is the very basis of what we understand as physical theatres to this very day. Now, your local theatre may not look like this, but you'll be surprised how much it owes to this concept. Look at what you have. Uh, the, 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 the rising seats, the, um, the, the, the serried rows of seats. Um, you'll see because Dionysus was the, the first and primary god of this particular structure, you have the throne of the priest of Dionysus right there in the middle. Nowadays, we probably call it the royal box. Um, you have, uh, as I say, serried ranks of seats going out from it. And then you have uh, a very, two, two very important points. Uh, right at the bottom, you see the skein, the, the, the scenery, as it were, which was a permanent structure. And in front of it, a circle, remind, remind yourself of the campfire, called the orchestra, and on that, the altar, where the altar was, the fire is now the altar. The fire, which, let's remember, primitive man used to worship, is now the altar at the center of this storytelling um, um, arena. And everybody can see it, and whoever is on that altar, whoever is on that orchestra place can be seen and heard by everybody in the, dare I say, audience. Gather together to watch what occurs. Gather together to hear the story that is being told, whether that story is an act of worship, whether it is a representation of history, whether it is a recital of some epic poem by the bard or poet, they can hold that everybody there can see it and hear it and behind the performance or the ritual on the orchestra area you have this construction that is fundamentally a a scene setting backup it is a structure against which the action takes place now if you look at any theater today that concept, with the possible exception of theatre in the round, which I'll come to later, every theatre has that fundamental um, structure. It is all there. We even still use the terminology of scene, of scenery, of orchestra. We use it in a different sense, but it is still the same terminology. And eventually, using this this particular format as as the act of theater as the action of theater began to develop from simply the recitation of of, of a poet to the begin the, the the beginning of of performance to the the creation of actors and eventually professional actors such as thespis i talked about um as this began to develop um they also from the the, the skein of behind from the area of scenery began to bring on different things, masks being the first, because in the size and scope of that physical theater, people at the back, they might be able to hear, but they wouldn't be able to see as well. So the use of masks, the traditional, the, the, the Greek theater masks would come on, tragic mask, comic mask. You know what you're looking at because you can see it, but also props, the idea of using furniture, the idea of using articles, actual things, swords, um, would probably be, a, because of human nature, probably one of the first things to be used, but other, other aspects. They then began to realize the power of physical scenery. They would actually come up with 
remarkable constructions that they could bring out and onto the stage. They would use fire. They would use light. They would use effects. Um, they didn't have gunpowder because the Chinese hadn't told them how to do it at that stage. But they did have remarkable capacity to create an illusion, to tell the story not just verbally, but visually as well. And it was all enabled by the fact that they had created this space in which the audience could sit down while they told them a story. They had, at that point, created theatre as we understand it. A theatre rather than just the act of theatre. Now, fortunately for us, um, there are very, very many remains of such Greek theatres all across the Mediterranean region. Uh, and indeed, quite a lot of Roman copies as well. We have another picture to demonstrate that. Um, there you have it. And there you can see exactly what was there in the plan that we showed you a moment ago. You see, you are at the top of the seats and you can see if you're sitting there that the expression on the faces of the actors would be absolutely lost to you. But if large masks were worn, you had a better chance of understanding who was doing what. You are in, he is in the orchestra. He is at the center of the, of, if you like, the ring where the fire is the heart of it. Or in his case, it is the altar, or if not the altar, the position of the storyteller. And behind him, you can see a construct that allows the potential for um, other elements to be brought out into the performance area, the orchestra. This is a perfect example of what a sophisticated Greek theater would be like. And behind that scene, you would have places where actors, where performers, where the poets, the reciters, the bards would be able to to dress, to change, places for scenery to be kept. This was a theater exactly as we understand it. And it's important if, uh, for those of you who are new to this whole thing, and many of you may be speaking, I know I'm speaking to the converted on, on many levels, but it's important to bear that image in mind, to bear that basic plan in mind of what we have come to call the Greek amphitheater because that is the root of every theater you will ever walk into today. The amphitheater, the Greek amphitheater is the source. Now, it wasn't just the Greeks. I mean, as I say, the Romans um, built a lot of these as well. They didn't just build for sports and persecuting Christians in these big Colosseum type structures. There are plenty of those. If you're in Rome, the Colosseum is a place you have to go to. If you're ever in Tunisia, there's an even better one, slightly smaller, but in much better condition. They're all over the, the Mediterranean as well. But the Romans built theatres because they enjoyed it. The Romans were slightly, dare I say, cruder than their uh, Greek predecessors. Uh, many of their comedies tended to be very, very licentious. The plays of Plautus being the ones that uh, would immediately spring to mind. Um, but they still liked their tragedies. They still liked the bardic tradition. They still liked the, the telling of stories. And they were fascinated by history. Roman, Rome produced so many historians. They loved, but they weren't just historians. They were historians who wrote their thoughts. They would probably preface everything they wrote with, everything I tell you may be wrong. But the Romans loved it. And they took the idea, the, 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 the Grecian idea of theatre, and, and attempted again to improve upon it. Well, they couldn't, they couldn't improve upon the concept, merely on the form. Sometimes you'll see a much more square structure than the, the classic Greek amphitheatre. But the principle is still the same, that you put the bard at the heart of the, of the, of, of the theatre, and you allow people to sit around while he, she, or they tell you a story. Um, so it was the Greeks, to, to, to an almost largest extent, who codified the form of physical theater. It was they who found the concept, who 
married the concept of the natural amphitheater of what in the north further north in europe would have been the fire the, the fire the hearth and developed it into what we now know know as the audience and the orchestra and the scene so that that's the fundamental the, the next step which proves that we've been copying it ever since you have to jump forward about 2000 years and when you do that we're still in the same basic concept of theater shape now before the development of what we might call um modern theater uh, and i place that back about about 400 odd years there were still performers there were still actors they were still doing the concept of telling the, the tell, telling the tale telling the story they did it in a multitude of ways and as we as we as we pass into the um uh sort of before the 1500s and even uh, later than that the notion of the traveling player was very very common the notice the, the notion of the local storytelling the local performance was very very common the whole cycle of mystery plays that came out of out of england and also out of, of northern europe was very very common very often these performances were done on the back of a cart or a wagon where the actors the performers the bardics would tell the story while people gathered around in a semicircle they were still and, and the, the, the point i'm making the argument i'm making is not that the greeks were particularly brilliant which they were but that it is the natural way of doing it nature tends to find a way and nature found a way for storytelling it is natural to gather round and listen and gather is important round is important and listening is important so this idea of gathering round to listen which which the greeks brought to in their terms and in their time a scientific perfection because the acoustics in those places was quite extraordinary i remember being in one in in cyprus i think i've mentioned this before um a, a theater that was over two thousand years old uh, in, in the terrible condition but the acoustic in there was still remarkable was still as close to perfect as you're likely to get the greeks worked out how nature operates and so in this pre-elizabethan time uh, so did the village players, so did the traveling players. If they went to an inn, the, the, the classic inn would have a courtyard. Uh, above the courtyard, there would be balconies. And as the play was being performed in that courtyard, people would gather around and they would sit up on the balconies and watch the action taking place. Now, if you think about that, you're coming very close to the notion of theater as we know it today. But it was still following that basic set of rubrics set down by the Greeks in the formation of the amphitheater. There was no difference except in scale, in size, and probably in expenditure. But it's still exactly the same process. And in the courtyard of inns, where the audience would gather around the action, a new but equally ancient form of theater structure developed. And it still used the Greek concept of the amphitheater. If you look at the next picture, you will see exactly what I mean. And there it is, Shakespeare's globe. Now, when you look about, at that, we all, we've all seen pictures of the globe or the swan or the various other pictures or what the rose would have looked like. You'll notice that the important thing about each of them is they're round. It is a round structure. It is not a square, rectangular, oblong it is a round structure it is a circle and what you notice about that stage the classic shakespeare stage is that it thrusts out into the audience it is the orchestra of the great greek theaters it is exactly the same what you notice is that there are balconies all around rather like the ones you would have found in the inns 
where the strolling players might have performed, but also the upper tiers of seats in a Greek amphitheater. And still those same things, um, the, the, the other aspects of it, stage which is completely bare, completely open, just tell two pillars to hold up a roof over it. Behind that you have the scene, you have that back wall of the stage through which properties, actors, various other things can come. And behind that you have what was known as the tiring or a tiring room, the place where the actors could, um, could change their clothes, put on costumes and what have you. If you look at that, you sort of say, well, that's a new theater. But when you look at, when you think about it, it is no different except in construct to the fundamental principle of the Greek amphitheater. It's the same space. The terminology may have changed. We may have gone from orchestra to stage or platform or what have you. But the idea behind it hasn't changed at all. And it was a fundamental understanding as, as the art of theatre developed, as the art of the actor and the writer developed, the realisation that this was the best way. There was no better way. It is no different except in technology to sit around the fire and tell a story. As I always say, nothing in the world changes except fashion and technology. And this is simply an advanced technology of that very primitive form of storytelling. To gather around the fire, to gather around the speaker, to gather at the hearth, to gather around the bard, to listen to the tale of the Shanachim, to listen to the Norse sagas delivered by an elder of the, uh, uh, of the tribe. It's exactly that same process. So by the time we get to Shakespeare, he's building Greek theatres, or they are building Greek theatres in a new form but following exactly the same rules. Now, something did happen. After the Elizabethan period, after the great Commonwealth in England, and that, that, that kind of theatre has affected us in America, most particularly, when all theatre was banned, it was the Puritans who banned theatre. It was, I might, will point out, the only people in the world who've ever banned Christmas were the Christian Puritans. But anyway, when it came back, when Charles II came back to the throne, he brought with him a kind of theatre that had evolved in Italy, not, not, not particularly from the art of the actor, but from the art of the painter. And this notion of painted scenes with a huge picture frame around it, which we now call the proscenium arch. The proscenium comes from the Greek as well. But this notion that you build a large frame and in it you have the action of the actors backed off by painted scenes. But when you look at the early forms of those stages, you'll notice that it wasn't simply that. There was always a thrust into the audience. And if you look at early, I don't have one, but if you look at early illustrations of places like Drury Lane, you'll notice that the stage comes out on the level of the stage boxes. They were known as the stage boxes because they were virtually on the stage, as were in Elizabethan times, seats on the stage for pe rich people in the audience who could afford to sit so close to the action. So that same notion, even though the proscenium stage was fundamentally different in its physical construct, it was in a, a, a rectangular shaped building rather than a round one. That same notion still happened, that the orchestra thrust into the audience, that it brought the action and brought the telling of the story directly into the audience. They could sit around and listen to the story. That particular space became known when it was dropped and the band was put in there, the musicians were put in there as the orchestra pit. It was a pit in the orchestra for the musicians to sit. Hence, they became known as the orchestra. The Greeks are the responsible for everything. They're quite amazing. If you look at some of those great opera houses in Europe, some of the really magnificent ones, you'll notice that rather than the serried tiers of, of dress circle and upper circle and grand circle and poor people circle at the top, you will notice that many of them, 
the, the, the Royal Opera House in London, La Scala Milan. Look at all the great opera houses of Europe. They will have a stage with an, a pit in the orchestra. They will have a gathering of people on that level. And then around the walls, lines and lines and lines and lines of boxes. It is basically a Greek amphitheater, somewhat reshaped. But it's that same basic concept that everybody can see, everybody can hear, and that the action is brought to them by the bard, or in that case of the opera, by the singers and the musicians. But they're all fulfilling and following the principles laid down by that construct that the Greeks realized was the right way to do it, the best way to do it, the most efficient way to do it. Your modern opera house very often follows that rule. And even when you have that dress circle, grand circle, upper circle concept built within a proscenium theater, you're still following, because they step back in these, these serried ranks, you're still following that Grecian principle of the amphitheater. When Richard Wagner built uh, the Opera House at Beirut, uh, and if you ever go there, you'll notice it's not straight, it's slightly, it's angled. And that from the stage, it moves outwards. It's as though he took an amphitheater. The Abbey Theater in Dublin was built in very much on the similar lines, that you take the amphitheater and you cut out, rather it's like slicing into a pizza or half a pizza, you take out that center section and that's your theater construct but it's following the rules of the amphitheater by allowing the audience to, full, to fill further back, wider and wider, and that the acoustic will follow that. We haven't come up with anything better than the Greeks found. And so my argument is that modern theater stages are still ancient, that there is nothing new under the sun, that no better concept has been imagined for the action of theater than that which our, our primitive forebears already worked out. So I idea of, you know, a theater, the, the proscenium theater is merely a section of the amphitheater concept. That a thrust stage theater is a modern addressing of the amphitheater concept where you put the audience on three sides around an action uh, in a space where the story is told, where the fire would have been, where the bard would have stood. It is exactly that same notion. So what about theatre in the round, I hear you cry. Well, theatre in the round, when you think about it, is still part of that ancient concept. It is a much more primitive look at the concept of let us gather round the fire and listen to and watch the story being told. But in terms of theatre in the round, we're seeing it from all sides rather than three sides or two sides. But it's still that same initial um, form that our very ancient ancestors took when they wanted to tell a story. Sit down around the fire and you can see it from all sides. Theatre in the Around is nothing new. Theatre in the Around may be the most ancient form of theatre that we can actually address. And all the modern innovations that we have, for all the modern innovations that we have, stage lighting, sound effects, all the, all the various accoutrements of, of props and stage tricks and things that were invented, the Victorians were brilliant at that. The idea of, <clears throat> they had a scene at the back, but they put it on two rollers so that you could be seen to climb up a cliff not by you climbing, but by pulling the scenery down and creating an optical illusion. The star trap, so that you could spring from the depths of hell. All of these things are just simple technological additions to that fundamental stage structure. We are still the inheritors of the concept of presenting, of exhibiting the art that we inherit from the Greeks and the Greeks understanding all that primitive activity that went before them. Let's look at a very modern theater stage, our next picture, our last picture, I think. And there you have it. That is the main stage 
uh, in Stratford, Ontario, the main Shakespeare stage. What you are looking at is a Greek amphitheater that is fundamentally the same as that picture I showed you much earlier and that schematic I showed you much earlier. Here you have the perfect example of Greek thinking about the way theater works. And for those of you who have ever been there or have been to somewhere similar, um, the, uh, the, the old Guthrie Theatre in, in Minneapolis, if you're in the UK, the Chichester Festival Theatre, if you go to Stratford-on-Avon, when they do open-air theatre, they create this. This is the purity of theatre space. And this is nothing, whether you take a section of it, and if you look at the way the, the, uh, the rows of seats go, you can, as I say, you can cut a slice out of that like a slice of pizza, and you still have the amphitheater concept, the amphitheater construct. And in that space, where the fire might have been, where the altar might have been, where the bard or the poet would have stood, in that space, any form of theater can be enacted. Because fundamentally, every single form of theater is based on that simple principle, sit down till they tell you a story. We haven't improved on it. All we've done is develop it. The original fireplace of our distant ancestors may have gone, except in theater in the round. But we still gather round that semicircle when a tale is being told. Whether you are in your own home at a party and someone says, sing a song, most of us will gather around in a semicircle and listen to it. When you go to a lecture in university, that same principle will apply because we use the same word, lecture theater. Theater as a concept is not simply some airy fairy arty thing. It is fundamental to the way we gain, gather and understand and appreciate information. If you are a student of surgery, you go to an operating theater to watch it being done. If there was no way of watching it being done, it would be an operating room. We call it a theater because that's exactly what it was. Theater as a physical entity is as intrinsic to human development, more intrinsic, I would say, to human development than the concepts of universities and schools and what have you, because the theater was the first university, was the first school. It was the place where information could be obtained, where opinion could be uh, formulated and discussed, where one person could say to a large group of pe people, this is what I think, this is what I believe, this is what I know. Yes, James, it is fascinating. Uh, and that's the point, that human, human, human culture, if you like to use your phrase there, did develop from a cult concept. And that we, in order to disseminate that information, we needed a place in which it could be done efficiently, effectively, comfortably, safely. Safety brings us back to the fire comfortably brings us on to modern theatre and the fact that our theatre company has the most comfortable theatre seats in Pittsburgh. But that aside, it is the building of a theatre that creates the potential for art, which is the expression of human emotion, the expression of human feelings, to be exhibited. I would therefore argue that your art gallery is merely a, a painting theatre. Uh, a sculpture gallery is a sculpture theater. It's a pl the, th the term theater is much more, much bigger, much more important than simply the place you go to to watch a play. So I repeat that simple phrase. Even though the original fire may be gone, we still gather round in that semicircle while a tale is being told. And from that, we learn and we develop. Now, thank you, Greeks, for giving us all of that. Next week, I want to discuss um, four Greek playwrights who, to my mind, are the most 
well, certainly the best known. Uh, we have more of their work than many others, but I think they exemplify that growth and development in the concept of how you tell a story in a theatrical sense. The telling of the tale. And the four playwrights, I'm going to, and again, it's not going to be a major lecture, it's not academic, I'm just going to talk about them, are Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, and Aristophanes, who I mentioned last week. The three great tragedians of Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides, and the great writer of Aristophanes, uh, of comedy, Aristophanes. So that's next week. Um, and um, I hope you join me for that. I've just a few little tiny things to mention. Uh, of course, please, if you've enjoyed this webinar or any other, or even if you haven't, please make a donation. Uh, every single dollar counts. And at this end of the year, every dollar counts. And I, I will remind everybody, uh, one of the things that all theatre is suffering from at the moment is reduction in box office takings because people are still nervous uh, or unwilling or unable to actually attend plays where we've actually postponed our production of Endgame into May, uh, which we hope will, will, will make matters slightly easier for everybody. But every donation, every dollar counts. Just go to the website, click on it, and send us a few dollars. We will profoundly appreciate it and think of you in our prayers. Um, you can save the date if you're in the Pittsburgh area. Our gala is coming up. Saturday, March the 19th, 6 to 10 p.m. at Point View Hall, Carnegie Science Center. As you can see, the view is amazing and you're viewing the point. Um, and the point of being there is the view of the point. But uh, we're going to have a gathering. It's our 25th um, season, so a special celebration. Uh, please join us. It's very reasonably priced. You can find all the information. And in fact, you can now from this moment... Uh, book your, your tickets on our website. Um, so please go to the website and check it out, uh, and I'll give you more information as we get closer. Uh, as usual, I again thank all those foundations who supported and sponsored us for all our education programs. I ask you yet again, please spread the word about the YouTube channel, and please become a subscriber on the YouTube channel. It makes a big difference to us. Uh, and later this month, um, the final point is on Sunday the 27th, we will be having our next Expand the Canon stage play reading, which will be back to being live. It is completely free of charge. The play is called Rachel. Uh, you have to book, even though it's it's free, you have to book because there's limited seating. Go to the website, go to book tickets, and you'll find the, uh, the thing on the calendar. Click on that, make your reservation. Sunday the 17th, two performances as usual at 2 o'clock and 7 o'clock. Uh, but you can reserve those tickets right now on the website. And apart from that, please donate. And uh, I hope the weather improves. And I shall see you all, I hope, back here again next week.